I don't know if, I mean, I'm sure you, you all have. Have you had, ever had vivid memories about s- certain things when you're a kid that just, when you think about them, it's like you're almost there. It's like you can almost see it and feel it and touch it and smell it. When I was a, when I was a uh, uh, child, when my parents would, would go off for the night to go do something and left my brother to kind of watch over us, I would stay up late, and it was usually a Saturday night, and sometime after midnight, and I would search uh, the TV, um, the UHF stations, most of us know what that is today, most young people wouldn't have a clue what I'm talking about, but you know, you get the, you get the, uh, the, the two rabbit ears, and then you get the round one, and, just, and you get the fuzzy stations, but I, w- I would search them, uh, longing uh, to find the channel that Yeah, we're still on UHF. (laughs) That contained this guy, Basil Rathbone. He was Sherlock Holmes of the 1939 um, character of of the great detective. Um, I found him fascinating. He made about, uh, Basil Rathbone made about 14 movies, I think, in his career with Sherlock Holmes, but to me, he was was the best because he he portrayed Holmes as as this distant but confident guy. Um, He was the one that, in London, all of Scotland, Scotland Yard would, would turn to when they got stuck in a case. He, it was on his doorstep that people would come on Baker Street and uh, beg him, offering him whatever price to solve some problem, some mystery, some case that the police couldn't figure out. He was the one who could see what others couldn't see he was the one who knew what others didn't know, and he was the one who was willing to go further than others were willing to go. He believed that there was no mystery that logic and reason could not figure out. When you're a kid and you, and you watched him go into some of these dangerous situations, so many scary places, and especially as a young kid late at night, you know, when, when you'd sit there tense. No matter how tense you were, you felt safe with him because you knew that his composure, his abilities would get you to the end and the mystery would be unraveled and even the most scariest people would be undone and in the darkness of the places would come light and truth. It was great stuff. In the Bible. When I think about those passages that, that seem mysterious to us, that seem like unsolved cases, and I, and I think about the responsibility that God puts on us as a people to not just ignore them and, and pretend we didn't see them or to just fall back on saying, well, they're not really true or, or that part of the Bible isn't really inspired or, you know, that's what they used to believe a long time ago. We don't have to believe that that God has given us a responsibility to go after those mysteries because those mysteries, like all mysteries, matter. They make a difference. And God has given us his spirit within us to see what others don't see or what we didn't see, to know what we didn't know, and and to go further than we thought we could go as we press in to know the God that loves us and knows us.
As we continue our, our series on, call, what did you mean by that? Or God, what did you mean by that? I want to look at one of those passages or a couple of verses that when we read them in the Bible, if we're really paying attention, they catch us and they almost stop us dead in our tracks. The passage that I want to look at or the verses that I want to key in on this morning, John 9, verse 31, we read this. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. I want you to think about that for a minute. God does not listen to sinners. So it, it poses the question for us. It's further down. God doesn't listen to anyone who sins. He only listens to people who are godly all the time. It's interesting, in 1980, Bailey Smith, who was uh, a pastor from Oklahoma, and he was uh, president of the Southern Baptist Convention, created this incredible stir. Let me uh, just read you uh, his remarks. They were kind of um, off the cuff at the end of a speech he was given. Giving. He said this, It is interesting to me at great political battles how you have a Protestant to pray and a Catholic to pray and then you have a Jew to pray. With all due respect to those dear people, my friend, God Almighty does not hear the prayer of a Jew. For how in the world can God hear the prayer of a man who says that Jesus Christ is not the true Messiah? It is blasphemy. I mean, it created a, a, a torrent. In fact, uh, speaking at that convention that year was Ronald Reagan, who was running for president. And so people came rushing to him saying, do you agree with that? But not offend others. Ultimately, he said, I don't. Uh, later on uh, that year, Jerry Farwell came out with a statement saying the same thing, that God does not listen to the prayers of Jews. So who's right? When it says that God doesn't listen to the prayers of sinners, when we look and we expound that God doesn't listen to the prayers of those who don't love the Savior. Is that true? Is that right? And, and should we really care? Does it really make a difference to us? Well, it's one of the mysteries of the Bible you can't ignore because it matters to us because it's, Part of it is, what does it say about God? What does it say about the character of God? Is God someone who just, if you're not perfect, if you're not righteous, if you're not always walking in his will, he's not going to hear you? What does it say about his love and his mercy and his ability to pardon? What does it say about his compassion and concern? What does it mean for us? What does it mean for you and I as Christians who call ourselves followers of Christ and yet at times can just plunge headlong into sin? Does God stop hearing us? Does God turn his back away from us? And what does it mean for the lost? If a person's lost in praise to God, will God hear them? Will God show compassion? Will he show his grace? Will he make his love known in Christ? It's one of those mysteries that if you ignore it in the Bible, you're going to keep on tripping over it. In fact, 
There are numerous passages. Let me go backwards. Where we can uh, see the same thing going on. Jeremiah 11, 11. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will surely bring calamity on them uh, which they will not be able to escape. And though they cry out to me, I will not listen to them. Psalm 66, 19. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. And there are, there are numerous more passages over and over again where we're t told that if we're on the other side of God, if we're involved in idolatry or if we're an enemy of those that he loves and cares for, if we are walking in a direction that is opposite of him, he won't hear us. And in the New Testament, the one that sticks out the most is one that we just looked at from John chapter 9. So does God hear us when we pray? Does he hear us all the time? Does he respond to us? Or is it only at certain times when we're in those certain places and periods of life when, when, we're, when we've got it together and we're acting righteous and holy and we feel that we've got it all plugged in? If you have your Bibles, because this isn't all printed up there, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 9. Just Sorry about this. I thought I had it already pulled up. second here. John 9, beginning at verse 1. As he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. Now, when you hear that, you hear distortion, don't you? Automatically, there's a mindset that if something bad is going on in someone's life, it's because they're on the other side of God, that, that they've angered God, that he's not listening to their, pro to their prayers, to their cries, to their pleas. And yet Jesus says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them, wash in the pool of Siloam. So this man went, washed, and came, came home seeing. His neighbors, those who had formerly seen him begging, asked, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? 
Some claimed that he was, others said no. He only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. Now, it's interesting, the resistance that can come to us when we see change in people's lives and we say, it can't be real because I know who they used to be. And who they used to be was, was someone God wanted nothing to do with, therefore their change can't be real. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I... I don't know it. I don't know, he said. They brought, uh, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the eyes of the man was a Sabbath. Before the Pharisees, who also asked him how he had received his sight, he put, on, he put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I was washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was blind, born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said, to this, said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind, Give gl glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this, is a, this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. No one has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Now, <coughs> what's going on here? Something very powerful is being revealed. And what's being revealed is that these religious people who prayed all the time didn't know God. They knew the law of God, but they didn't know the heart of God. These people who believe that Prayer only worked when you were righteous. Found out for themselves that it's when you think you're righteous that your prayers don't work. Look what Jesus says, <coughs> verse 35. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out in the Son of Man. Who is he? Sir, the man asked, tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, 
You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. The man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. So what's the bottom line? Is it true, does God hear the prayers of sinners? Or is that just a misunderstanding that he doesn't hear the prayers of sinners? He doesn't care about the prayers of sinners. Here's the truth that Jesus was revealing God always hears those who listen to him. God always hears those who listen to him. Hearing and listening are responsive acts. When we respond to God, he responds to us. When we speak to him, he hears us. And when he speaks to us. We're called to listen to him. God always hears the prayers of those who listen to him. Listen to what we read in John 14, verse 12. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. God hears, God always hears anyone who listens to him. Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, I'll hear, and I'll respond to. But it was that, it was that caveat, in my name, why do people pray? People pray because they're looking for truth or wisdom. People pray because uh, they're looking for God's intervention. Uh, people pray because they want to find greater fellowship with God. Those are the right reasons people pray. But if you're praying not really looking for truth, if you're praying just looking for a good idea or how to get out of a bad situation so you can go off and enter another one, yeah, God's probably not going to hear you. If you pray because you want God to intervene and, and to take your plans and make them work and those plans are going in a direction that are opposite of how God would have you to go, God's not going to hear your prayers. If you're praying that, God, I want to be close with you and I want to feel your and I want to do it while I'm doing all the things that you don't want me to do, God's not going to hear your prayers because he can't. God can't bless what isn't blessable. God won't respond to static. God loves us so much that he'll hear anyone who is willing to listen to him, who is really willing to respond back to him with what he says. So is it true that God doesn't hear the prayer of sinners? Yeah, it's true. But that's not the point. The point is that God hears the prayers of everyone who's willing to listen. 
He hears the prayers of anyone who is willing to turn in his direction and go his way. When we read that he doesn't hear the prayers of sinners, he's not talking about people who are, are living their lives for Christ and yet they get distracted or they get deflected to some sin and they're struggling and they're praying to God to help them. God hears that. In fact, there are periods in our lives, and we all know it, where we can come from periods where we want to be as close as possible to God. And, and we are doing the right things and going in the right directions, and things start to work out for us. And then we take a left turn. I mean, look at the story of Moses. You see it all the time. When things are going great, all of a sudden, Moses goes down to Egypt during a famine instead of trusting God. And he sells his wife out by saying it's his sister because the Pharaoh's got an eye for her. And you say, Moses, how could you do that? But God didn't stop hearing. God didn't stop paying attention. We have those times in our lives. God understands that when we come to Christ, we are being perfected. We are not perfect. And in that perfection, we are going to mess up. In fact, uh, Paul tells us that God hears, we're told in Romans, the cry of our spirits within us that we don't even hear. The cry of uh, that godly call within us that calls out to him even when we're heading in wrong directions. God always hears those who are willing to listen. Yeah, if you're not willing to listen, if your heart really isn't loving God and partaking of Christ, then he's not going to hear because it's just static to his ears. It is, it is just you calling him to bless sin, which he can't do. Does God hear the prayers of a sinner who doesn't know him and yet cries out for Does God hear the prayers of a person who doesn't know Christ but, but all of a sudden hears about him through the gospel and wants, of course. God always hears those who are willing to listen. That's what makes prayer such a powerful thing. In fact, when we talk about prayer, I keep turning, it's actually over here, right? What is prayer? Prayer is the assurance of God's presence. When we pray, we are blessed with knowing that God is right there. In John chapter 1, verse 12, we are told that we have been given the right to be called the children of God. Anytime a child goes up to his parent and starts talking, any good parent is going to listen. Prayer reminds us that God is present, that God exists. Why is it we're called to pray? Because in prayer, we're reminded we are not alone. How many times do you find yourself in some situation that concern or awareness turns to concern and concern turns to worry and now you just spend your time worrying, trying to figure out what you're going to do and you go around and around and around before you finally come to God in prayer. Because all of a sudden it hits you, wait a minute. 
I can't do this by myself. All of a sudden, you remember, there is a God. And this is what he's here for. What is prayer? Prayer is the assurance of God's presence. Prayer is the evidence of God's benevolence. Because when we pray, when we turn to him, God responds back to us and he blesses us. We see the goodness of the God who created us and not only the God who blesses us in creating, but the God who blesses us in sustaining, the God who blesses us in redeeming, and the God who blesses us one day in returning for us. When we pray, we see, we experience, we feel God's benevolence. Sometimes it's just, it's that immediate benevolence of our hearts and our minds are calmed because we realize it's going to be okay. Sometimes it's when we see things shift in front of us very quickly. Other times it's when we don't see things shift quickly, but we just know I can let go and he'll show up. Prayer is the prominence of our dependence because when we pray, it brings us back to depending on him. You and I are totally inadequate for everything. For everything. You want to be a good spouse? You're inadequate. You want to be a, a good parent? You're inadequate. You want to be a great witness for Christ? You're inadequate. We only become adequate when God works through us, when God works in us, when we realize it and we turn to him and we get on our knees and we pray and we ask him to intercede. We ask him to forgive us. We ask him to, to direct us. It's only when we get on our knees and we praise him and realize that he's the only one that matters. Prayer reveals the prominence of our dependence. How dependent are we? Because we are only as adequate as we are dependent. And when we're not dependent, we are totally inadequate it also reveals the transparency of our obedience it, it, it's interesting when we talk about does God hear the, the prayers of sinners like we put it all on God the truth is when people are sinning and they're going in that direction with that devil may care, care attitude they don't care about praying. Think about it. When you are in a situation where you know you're sinning, where you know that God wouldn't be happy with this, but we'll just keep him in the closet for now until later. You're not praying. Because as a believer, there's no way to pray to, with, to God without conviction. There's no way to pray to God and ask for his intervention when we know we're going in the wrong direction. Prayer, it's a sign. It's a revealing. It's, it's a transparency of our obedience to God. Because when we're praying, we're asking ourselves, is this what God wants? Or we're asking ourselves, God, what is it that you want? When we're asking for something, we're asking for it in Jesus' name, according to the things that Jesus would do. Trusting in the Father who del delivered him who will deliver us. <coughs> 
Prayer reveals our obedience. It brings it to light. Look what we read in... uh, I keep doing that. All right, Andreas, I'm never to have this again. Look what we're told in James chapter 5. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Does God hear the prayers of those who don't care, who are happy with living a sinful life? No, he doesn't. Does God hear the prayers of those who are struggling in their sin? Yes, he does. But one thing you can be assured of is this. That when you're feeding off of Christ, as we said last week, like a hungry person turns to a hamburger. When you're doing that, God hears your prayers. In fact, your prayers become powerful and effective. Because the more we look for truth, the more we look for God to intervene according to his will, the more we look for his fellowship and intimacy with him, he hears us. And he acts. And powerful things happen. I think sometimes as Christians, one of the reasons we can live such blasé lives is because our prayer lives are blasé. We might say a quick prayer at meal or at night, or but it's quick and it's not, we don't approach it like it's powerful. Let me give you a little bit of help. How do we do that? At the end of the day, review your day. Just look at the day and look at what's gone on. What's gone on with you, the things you've done, and and review where God has been, where he has showed up, where he has met you, and the things that you were intentional in. And then reflect upon it. Ask yourself, what do I know about myself? What do I know about myself that that I need to change, I need to be aware of, I need to keep in prayer? What, What do I know about God? What have I learned about life? Review, reflect, and then go apply it. I have uh, people do a little exercise sometimes in counseling. I'll tell them this. Take the next week, sit down, and write down the top 10 things that keep tripping you up in life. Just write down the top 10 things that that you keep tripping over. Your desire to make everybody happy. Or or your selfishness and narcissism and or or your jealousy and whatever it is, write it down. And when they come and they show it to me, I tell them now, go take that and turn it into a prayer. Go take that and turn it into a prayer. Turn it into a prayer that begins with God. I love you and I I know you're there for me. Help me to trust in you so that when I go to work, no matter what happens, what problems come, I already know you have the answers. So let me just be at peace knowing that you're trustworthy. Let me live my day today with priorities and and help me to keep reflective on what they are. Father, help me today 
to watch the, the words that I use. Help me to, to look at the motives that get Creating a prayer that will make your life more effective. Creating a prayer that you know this is exactly what God wants to see happen in your life. And then pray it every morning. I have people who pray it every morning, at lunchtime, and in the evening. Because they want to stay mindful and intentional. They, they understand that these are problems and they've been going on for a long time. And only God can help th them with it. But they've got to do their part and be mindful. The issue is this. God loves you. And he has given you this great privilege to pray. And as long as you're willing to listen, he will always hear. As long as you're willing to listen, he'll always give you the truth. He'll always intervene for the right reasons, for the right things, and he'll always draw you nearer. Let's join our hearts in prayer.